Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Insights, Newcastle University's Public Lectures Programme. Uh, my name is Martin Farr. I'm co-chair of the Public Lectures Committee. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you at the beginning of a new Insights programme. Um, we wanted to begin with something which marked the anniversary of an institution which is very important to the university, and we, we hope very much that the programme, which I had brought with me to show you, uh, is on the table outside. The um, programme covers a vast array of what the university does in terms of its teaching and research, um, and the medical school is such an enormous part of that, and the health service is such an important part of our lives. So we were very keen to mark the 75th anniversary uh, of the health service. And our speaker today is a political and social historian who took his BA at Oxford and then had a year as a civil servant in the Department of Communities and Local Government in 2013, which those of you who know about uh, or can remember the time, this was a period of, great, um, of uh, great cuts in public sector spending and in local government grant in particular. And our speaker did not enjoy the experience of working under Eric Pickles uh, at uh, the Department of Communities and Local Government in 2013 and chose instead, as you can imagine, uh, why he might, seven years in New York, uh, taking his PhD at uh, the University of New York. Um, and his PhD research has found fruition in the book published widely and very complimentarily reviewed into the history of the National Health Service. His next project, is now moved from Oxford to UCL, University College London, is on the legacies of the coal industry in Britain, uh, in terms both of health and the institution and environmentalism. And so as we move from the health service into the coal industry, um, and I hope you find this a very stimulating and interesting talk, and so please would you join me in welcoming our speaker, Andrew Seaton. Hello. Um, thanks so much, Martin, for that introduction. Uh, and uh, thanks so much for the invitation to be able to speak uh, uh, and to open the program for uh, these lectures. Um, I think it's so wonderful that Universities can play such an important part in our communities by holding talks like this um, and bringing uh, research um, out into the community. So it's a real honor for me to uh, be able to talk to you today. Um, I didn't think that uh, Eric Pickles would be part of my introduction. My one enduring memory of, of being a civil servant in 2013 was, uh, as Marty said, there were a lot of budget cuts. But uh, at Christmas time, uh, there was a, just enough money to give us one uh, very tiny mince pie each. And I remember kind of queuing up, and Eric Pickles was the one who, who gave us the mince pie, and it was something out of a kind of Dickens novel, uh, the, the atmosphere of it. So that's, that's my probably enduring memory of the time uh, as a civil servant, but uh, uh, you know, somewhat happier now uh, as an academic. So uh, today we're, we're not going to talk about Eric Pickles, we're going to talk about the, the National Health Service. Um, and I'm going to address the, the title of the talk, The History of the NHS uh, and Its Future, uh, by speaking uh, about my new book, uh, which is a history of the NHS released, uh, as Martin suggested, in the same year that the, the NHS uh, celebrates its 75th anniversary. So founded in 1948, and it's its 75th anniversary this year in July, on 5th of July. Uh, and I, so I'm going to talk about the book uh, in order to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour of the, the NHS's history and then use the end of the lecture, the, the and its future bit, which is always risky as a historian to do, but um, to try and offer some reflections on what this history might mean for the NHS's present, obviously a very challenging uh, present circumstances that it faces, and its future. Uh, and then we have, of course, a Q&A to discuss anything particular of interest to you that I don't, that I don't touch on. So um, just a couple minutes then to start on, on what the book is, why I wrote it, and, and, and what it argues. So in kind of general terms, uh, the, the book is a, is a wide-ranging history of the NHS, uh, from the initial arguments of the for something like an NHS, which began way back in the Edwardian period in, in the early 1900s, up to the present day. And it tries to conjoin uh, politicians and medical experts with patients, members of the public, uh, campaigners, and cultural figures like novelists and filmmakers. So I tried to kind of offer a, a wide-ranging perspective in it. 
And I had a couple sources of inspiration in writing the book. The first was watching the 2012 uh, London Olympic Games, which feels like yesterday, but depressingly was 11 years ago, where those of you who watched the opening ceremony will be, will, will be reminded of the fact that the NHS played an important part of that opening ceremony. So there were many other facets of what it means to be British, including, you know, the Beatles and uh, uh, James Bond and these kinds of things. But then it was also the NHS. And uh, the day after, I was reading some of the reviews of the ceremony, and I was particularly struck by the American reviews, where they were like, oh, yeah, we like the James Bond, we like the, the Beatles, but we didn't understand why you'd put a health service in, in, your, in your Olympic opening ceremony. And, and that kind of struck me, and I thought, actually, they're right. They're onto something there. It, it is kind of strange where that came from and, and why that came about. And then the second uh, inspiration for the book was, was family connections, as I'm sure many of you in the room uh, have members of your family that work in the NHS or, or indeed work in the NHS yourselves. Uh, the NHS is the UK's largest employer. It's Europe's largest employer, and it's the fifth largest employer in the world, keeping uh, an eclectic company among the likes of the Chinese Red Army, Walmart, and McDonald's. <laughs> and so those are the things that kind of motivated me to write the book. And out of when I sort of began the research, sort of two questions came to mind. The first I've kind of hinted at already, why did this kind of government-funded, government-organized health system come to form such an important part of what it means to be British? So in opinion poll after opinion poll, it's the NHS that comes out top in what makes us most proud to be British. Why did that come about in historical terms? And then the second question is, why did the NHS, founded after the Second World War as part of a universal welfare state, why did the NHS survive, particularly in the 1970s, the 1980s, when other parts of the uh, welfare state or public industries, if we think about the coal mines or the railways and later water and so on, why did the NHS not only survive that crucial period of the 1970s and the 1980s, but only sort of expand and take on greater significance in public life? So those were the two questions uh, that I was interested in answering. And what I argue in the book is that the eventual celebration of the NHS was not automatic or inevitable. Uh, but came about over time. So people did not hold street parties for the NHS uh, or light buildings up blue. Indeed, the color blue was not associated with the NHS in the 1940s, and we'll come on to that. They didn't do that at its inception, um, nor was it popularly seen as emblematic of British values. This outcome, this kind of thing, was the result of active efforts by the NHS's supporters to adapt the service to social change, to associate the NHS deliberately with Britishness, and to uh, outwit many of the service's opponents who favored a more free market approach to organizing health services. The eventual support that surrounded the NHS in turn helped the institution survive. So when many other parts of the welfare state or public industries did not, we do not, for, inst for instance, talk about our council housing, but we do regularly talk about our NHS. And put another way, the public support for the NHS and its survival, I argue in the book, had to be made and worked for rather than assumed. It wasn't automatic that people would love this institution in the way that they do, despite contestation around the edges. So that's a little bit about what to expect from reading the book, uh, if you buy a copy, uh, and what it argues. So now for a sense of the history of the NHS that the, the book follows. So uh, the book begins uh, with the foundation of the NHS. And the first point to make here is that you know, it's not right to assume that there was no healthcare before 1948 when the NHS was set up. So we sometimes have this idea of this kind of barren landscape uh, that existed before 1948. And then when Aniron Bevin, the health minister in the Labour government after the Second World War on the left here, who I'll talk about in a minute, when he kind of founded the NHS, suddenly there was healthcare. 
uh, that's not true. There was, there was a, a, a range of, of different health services that existed in the 1920s, the 1930s, but these were kind of organized along a, a, a mix of uh, private health services where you paid out of your own pocket, voluntary health services, kind of charities who run things like voluntary hospitals, and then also the state. Uh, so a big uh, example of this would be uh, the National Health Insurance System, which, exi which existed in the 1920s and the 1930s. And if you earned, if you were an, usually an industrial worker and you earned under a certain amount of money, you got access, you paid in uh, a contribution out of your uh, weekly pay packet and you got access to what was known as a panel doctor. So you could get access to health services through some government schemes as well in the 1920s and the 1930s. But the crucial point is that there were significant gaps in that health system that existed before the NHS. So uh, I, I just mentioned the national health insurance uh, system. You could get access to uh, a GP through that system, but your dependents i.e. if you were a man, and most uh, workers were men at this point, if you were a man, your wife or your children would not get access to healthcare through that scheme. And what this meant uh, is that in times of economic distress, of which there were many in the 1920s and the 1930s, of course the Wall Street crash in 1929, which caused uh, a, a, a fairly long depression in, in uh, different parts of the country, particularly uh, areas like Newcastle, uh, there were very hard decisions that had to be made between you know, feeding yourself or paying for your kid to go to the doctor. And so these kinds of gaps uh, in the eyes of reformers scarred the health system that existed in the 1920s and the 1930s. And it was believed that something like a national health service, although there were different uh, names for it, state medical service was another one that was used. It was believed that something like an NHS could solve those kinds of problems. Figures like Edith Summerskill on the right-hand side here, who was a, a doctor turned politician, uh, campaigned for the health service on that basis, and she was very interested in maternal and, and child health. Uh, here she is giving, uh, I think, free orange juice to, to a child. After the Second World War, uh, as many of you will know, uh, you know Winston Churchill was defeated uh, in favour of uh, Clement Attlee's Labour Party, who swept to power on a, on a landslide victory, uh, at, with promises to found uh, a universal welfare state. Now, they had to enact the, these kind of pre-existing proposals for something like uh, a state medical service. And the man who was responsible for doing that is on the left here, Aniron Bevan. Now, Bevan was uh, a, a Welsh so socialist. Uh, he was from South Wales. He worked in the, the coal mines as a teenager and grew up to become Minister of Health and Housing in the post-war Labour government. Uh, and he uh, entered, when he proposed the NHS, as I'm sure many of you will also know, a protracted battle with uh, the doctors represented by the British Medical Association, the BMA, who didn't like the idea of an NHS. Apologies to any doctors in the audience. Um, and they saw it as kind of state control over their, um, over their profession, and it would impinge on the kind of doctor-patient relationship. Now, one of the things I talk about in the book that's kind of less well known is that those kinds of concerns were not just particular to the doctors. They were also shared by uh, sizable parts of the population. And if you look at uh, opinion polls and surveys from the period, there is uh, certainly support for a universal healthcare service organized by the government that delivers care free. But there are also these concerns about what it would mean for the government to organize your local doctor's surgery or your local hospital. As one woman remarked in one of these surveys, I hate anything which is controlled by the government. And in response to these concerns, the Labour government uh, deployed kind of a fairly wide ranging, what we would understand now as a public relations campaign to encourage people to use the NHS and to come to see it not as this kind of cold, bureaucratic machine, 
embodied by phrases like state medicine, but this kind of caring, humanistic thing called the National Health Service, which was there to look after you and your family. And they did this through films, talks. Uh, Edith Summerskill went on the radio a few times. You know, there was this kind of public relations campaign to almost sell the NHS to the British public. So what we can see here then is that already, even at its foundation, there were these attempts to kind of promote the NHS. It wasn't automatic that everyone would have uh, the feelings that they would have later on towards it. So with the, with the NHS set up in 1948, uh, it, it entered uh, patients and members of the public entered its uh, GP consulting rooms and its hospitals. Uh, and what I do in the book is I, I kind of look at a period of what I describe as modernization. So this is a kind of modernizing the health service in its early years. And this run from basically up to the 1970s, so the late 1940s to the, to the 1970s. And this, of course, in itself is an important period in British history that begins with rationing and post-war austerity in the 1940s when the NHS came about. And then by the late 1950s and into the 1960s, it's shaped by growing consumerism and affluence, people getting access to cars, to holidays, these kinds of things for the first time, as well as things like changing gender roles uh, and attitudes to sex and greater ethnic and racial diversity into Britain through Commonwealth immigration. So the NHS had to modernize, it had to adapt to these kinds of social changes. Now the NHS began on shaky ground. I've given you a bit of a sense of that with the kind of doctor's opposition and, and some of the, the public feeling towards it. Another point that, that, it, that it's kind of struggled with was money. Um, there, there was simply a lack of funds given to the National Health Service when it started. We sometimes think about the post-war era as this kind of golden age of the welfare state where you've got free milk and free orange juice and these kinds of things. But actually, in terms of money given to welfare services, it was actually very, very low. The Labour government after the Second World War spent more on the military and maintaining the British Empire than it did on the welfare state, for example. So there wasn't a lot of money to go around. And what this meant is that the NHS, you know, it couldn't overnight build a load of new hospitals or a load of new health centers like this one in Devon from the 1960s. These kinds of things took time to come about. And to make matters worse, uh, many of the NHS's early critics who continued beyond 1948 uh, whipped up a feeling of crisis that it was that too much money was being spent on the health service, particularly when compared to the initial estimates. So one prominent opponent of the service writing in the British Medical Journal, uh, a radiologist uh, called Frank and Roberts in the early 1950s, he insisted uh, in quite gloomy predictions that the NHS would involve us in national ruin and because it was this kind of black hole that was absorbing more and more money, uh, eventually the, the Britain would become kind of subservient to the NHS and it would push Britain down a road towards authoritarianism. So these were the kinds of things, that the arguments that were in, in the air about the amount of money that were being spent on the NHS. The NHS, as I mentioned, also had to adapt to social change in order to avoid a reputation as an impersonal or unresponsive state institution. So what I'm emphasizing here is the fragility of the NHS in its early years, but nonetheless how it still managed to embed itself in British life through <laughs> low level changes as part of a program of modernization. So some of, this, some of these modernizing policies were actually quite low key. It wasn't all about kind of funding brand new sort of concrete hospital buildings. Some of it could be quite um, ephemeral, sort of easily missed. So let's take the example of wards on hospitals. So at the, the start of the NHS, um, many hospitals uh, were organized on uh, something called the, night the hospital wards, sorry, were organized on something called the Nightingale 
pattern, named after Florence Nightingale, the Victorian uh, nursing pioneer. And what this meant is that you had like quite large, drafty wards you, where you'd have somewhere between sort of 20, 30 beds. You'd have a row of each bed sort of along the wall. And then you'd have no subdivisions between those beds, or rarely subdivisions. And you'd have windows that you could open. And that was out of a kind of Victorian, old, an older Victorian belief that uh, a kind of pre uh, understanding of germs, so before, you know, a kind of understanding of bacteriology, that disease was spread through bad airs, and what you needed to do was open the window and blow, blow that out of the way. The NHS started with many of those same institutions built along those lines. But what, what happened is when you get into the 1950s and the 1960s, I mentioned affluence and consumerism among the British population, people start to have different expectations about what they should receive, the type of care that they should receive on a hospital ward. And that included a kind of right to personal space and privacy, even on a kind of shared communal ward. So this is a photo of um, the Ingham Infirmary in South Shields, not, not too far from here. And um, what you see is you see one of these older Victorian wards that's been retrofitted with cubicles and curtains. And what this did, it seems, you know, a kind of simple, straightforward, you know, maybe a relevant kind of change. But doing these kinds of things gave, you know, helped meet patients' expectations about personal space and privacy in a way that, you know, uh, that was kind of financially possible in a way that building a whole new hospital wasn't. So the point here again is that the, the kind of support for the NHS was again not automatic. It had to, you know, it had to adapt to kind of social change, things like raise it, raised expectations among the public in order to embed itself. Now, of course, this, this process of modernization was not perfect or complete, but it did show an institution that was willing to adapt with wider social change, uh, often with very little money. And the NHS largely avoided a reputation as inflexible or this kind of monolithic state system, which was an accusation that was successfully leveled at other parts of the welfare state and other public industries. So the second part of the book uh, looks at the NHS in the world. Now, the NHS is, is now seen to us as a, as a quintessentially British institution that many, uh, many people take pride in. But it also had lots of connections with other parts of the world and indeed was shaped by it. Now, the clearest way to see this is through Britain's experience of uh, Commonwealth immigration after 1945. Indeed, the service was founded at the very moment when Britain began to lose many of its colonies. So it was founded in 1948. The year before, India and Pakistan had gained their independence. Malaya in 1957, Nigeria in 1960, and so on and so on. Thousands of the patients that, that the NHS served and the people who worked within it hailed from the countries that were once part of the British Empire and now formed what was referred to as the Commonwealth. And the NHS would not have been able to provide its guarantee of universal health care without the support of these workers. We're talking about nurses, consultants, porters, cleaners, laundry workers, these kinds of things. Uh, it, you know, it's not an exaggeration. I'm not just saying that. So in the early, uh, early 1970s, a third of all doctors in the NHS had gained their medical qualifications from overseas. And that rate was even higher in kind of industrial areas like Newcastle, where doctors often didn't want to move to. Um, and, the, and these doctors made... Uh, these, these workers, not just doctors, these workers made huge contributions. Uh, you know, uh, uh, large numbers of nurses draw, drawn from the Caribbean, countries like Jamaica, for instance, like this, this lady on the left here. Others would be um, this, 
guy on the right here, Ossie Fernando, who I was really lucky enough to speak to and interview for the book. He's now a now retired transplant surgeon who immigrated to the UK in 1962 from uh, uh, Sri Lanka. He thought he was just going to stay here a couple of years, but then in a common story, uh, stayed in the UK and then was part of a, a pioneering uh, kidney transplant team at the Royal Free Hospital in London. Now, to be sure, many, uh, most politicians and parts of the press welcomed the contributions of these workers from overseas. Most medical encounters went by without overt racial discrimination. As one consultant in a survey of doctors from ethnic minority backgrounds during the 1980s summed up, if race was the first thing that people thought about when accessing care, he said, you wouldn't have a health service at all in this region. But all the same, these employees were also subjected to discrimination and racism, and often in surprising ways. So um, I found uh, letters uh, of members of the public who they would go to their local hospital, uh, they would be met by uh, an Indian doctor, and they would request a white doctor. Now, pleasingly, some of these hospitals showed them where to go, Others accommodated those requests and gave them, a, a, gave them a white doctor. This was kind of a thing that was going on uh, in those post-war decades. So what all this means then is that the ideas of our NHS and the service as a distinct national achievement, which were kind of only growing as the decades rolled by, could also kind of be drawn into sharp contrast who belonged and who didn't, right? Did the Indian doctor working in the NHS, was he part of our NHS or was he not? These kinds of questions were, you, were in the air and were weaponized uh, by critics of, of immigration in the post-war period. So we see there how the NHS is more than just a medical system. It's also this kind of lightning rod for this wider debate about immigration uh, in the UK that continues today. The final part of the book uh, reflects on the NHS's history from the 1970s up to the present. Now, these final chapters consider the difficulties that the service faced after the 1970s when an atmosphere of crisis seemed to permanently surround the institution in a way that it didn't before, at least not to the same extent and predictions of its imminent or actual demise became ever more common. However, what I emphasize in these chapters is the NHS's surprising survival, even as it changed and indeed it became marketized, the extent of that marketization is up for debate and also um, it did survive compared to those other parts of the welfare state. So, you know, we think about uh, mass council housing sold off in the 1980s. That didn't happen to the NHS, right? So it is this institution that has this resilience. Now, starting with the 1970s, in the 1970s, the, the NHS started to enjoy more money and budgets which improved on that immediate post-war period that we've been discussing. Nonetheless, these increases in funding, uh, as many of you will know or perhaps remember, uh, the 1970s were a very economically uh, turbulent time, high inflation, uh, strikes, high energy prices, all stuff that is completely alien to us right now. Uh, it was a very turbulent time, and the NHS's budget kind of boomeranged as different governments came into power. And this economic instability also created the space for different arguments about how British healthcare should be organized to come into the mainstream. Now, one such sort of fresh approach emerged after the election of Margaret Thatcher, pictured here on the left in 1979. Now, as many of you will know, Margaret Thatcher was no fan of the universal welfare state all public industries set up after the Second World War. She thought that they were inefficient uh, and that they tended to uh, impinge on people's independence rather than uh, support them. Now, Thatcher also had radical designs 
for healthcare. And this makes sense. Alongside pensions, it was the largest part of the welfare state, and it was a symbol of a kind of earlier labor, social democratic politics. Now, we have a memory today of uh, Margaret Thatcher standing on stage at the Conservative Party conference in, uh, I think, 1983, where she said that the NHS was safe with us. Uh, but what I show in the book, uh, using sources from uh, the Conservative Party archives, among other places, is um, that actually there was a fairly long tradition, both on the political right and in the Conservative Party, to think about ways to move away from the NHS. And at first, when she came to power, uh, the Thatcher government explored the viability of long-standing plans to shift Britain to a system of private health insurance. Uh, indeed, on the eve of the 1979 general election, the internal Conservative Party Health Study Group had concluded in private that the NHS was, quote, better discarded altogether and a fresh start made in light of knowledge accumulated and experienced gained. Now, in the, to them, a system of private health insurance would provide greater choice. It would solve the funding problems with healthcare in the UK because people would be reaching into their own pockets, they'd be putting more money into the system. It would in, it expand privacy. Uh, these kinds of arguments, uh, those kinds of values, what they, what they base those arguments on, choice, privacy, those kinds of things. And here she is meeting with BUPA, the British United Provident Association, the largest supplier of private health insurance in the country. But as we all know, these proposals uh, didn't become a reality. Britain did not abandon the NHS and move towards a private health insurance model. One of the reasons is that the NHS is it, it's not simple to get rid of something as large and as administratively complex as the National Health Service. Uh, the private health in industry, things like BUPA, didn't have the capacity to suddenly insure everyone in the, the country. But also, the public didn't like the idea um, and what you see in the 1980s is you see uh, the emergence of a fear of American medicine. Now, many of us, when we think about health systems abroad, our mind immediately goes to the US, right? The private health insurance model, paying out of your own pocket, you know, the bankruptcy, all of these kinds of things. But this was a kind of cultural argument if you look at... Uh, uh, surveys and, and private testimony that really came to the fore in the 1980s. And the problem for the Thatcher government is that that fear of American medicine was associated with private health insurance. And so therefore, the public were even more disinclined to embrace that as an alternative. And so what you see in the 1980s is this wasn't accidental. The supporters of the National Health Service um, put forward the comparison between private healthcare and American medicine. So one of the ways that I trace this in the book is I look at uh, television and, and film. And I, I interviewed some of the, um, the campaigners and, and activists who made these programs, who sort of studied American healthcare and made these kind of comparisons of what the Thatcher government wanted to do. And they had very fun titles like Sick in Sheffield, Broken Beverly Hills, or Kentucky Fried Medicine. That's my favorite one. Um, so for all these reasons, the private health insurance uh, you know, aspirations on the political right uh, failed. But by the mid-1980s, the Thatcher government pursued several policies uh, which went down a different track. And rather than kind of privatizing the National Health Service, there was, a pro there was policies to marketize it, to bring in business principles into the heart of the service. Now, one such approach was the outsourcing of in-house NHS work, things like cleaners or caterers or laundry workers that were NHS employees the Thatcher government thought that you know, private companies could do this more cheaply, they could do it cheaper, 
uh, they could do it more efficiently. So that work should be put out to contract and private companies should do it. And this was a policy that was enacted in 1983. You also see in the mid-1980s the introduction of general managers in the NHS. And if you, if you speak to anyone who works or has worked in the NHS, uh, managers do not come off very well at all. Um, but uh, they were nonetheless introduced uh, in the mid-1980s out of a belief that this would make this state institution more efficient and run better. And Thatcher also squeezed the health budget, which, as I said, was starting to see increases in the 1970s. Um, it, she squeezed it to an increase of 2% every year. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's still an increase. But the story of healthcare after the 1970s in almost every industrialized country is it's not a question of are you going to give more public money to your health system? It's a question of how much more money are you going to give it to keep pace with rising uh, wages, you know, innovations in, in technology, uh, these kind of new buildings, these kinds of things, health services after the 1970s in nearly all countries, the government is putting in more and more money. So, but, and it started the annual increases in the budget, which was starting to look a bit more healthier in the 1970s, Thatcher kind of squeezed those down. Now, all of these policies together created this kind of atmosphere of crisis around the National Health Service. It was, you know, much like today to pick up a newspaper or turn on the radio and hear the, uh, read about the NHS or listen about the NHS was to uh, be kind of embroiled in this atmosphere of apprehension or even this feeling that the NHS was about to die or even, according to this guy on the right here, uh, a trade unionist had died in 1985. I was born a few years after that. I won't say how many years, but I was born a few years after 1985. Uh, and I, I think I was born in the NHS. But to, this, to people uh, campaigning for it, the NHS had died. You know? So there were these kinds of predictions of the NHS's kind of imminent demise from the 1970s, and particularly in the 1980s. Now, supporters of the NHS uh, used the term privatization to discuss uh, a lot of what was going on in the NHS, and this kind of escalated the sense of crisis. Now, these arguments about privatization, I argue in the book, were very, very effective in sharpening public intention on the institution, but historically, they sometimes obscure a little bit more than they reveal. So let's take the example of outsourcing introduced by the Thatcher government, uh, things like laundry and cleaning in the 1980s, as I mentioned. Despite that policy, the vast majority of cleaning services remained in-house during the 1980s, the 1990s, and the 2000s. And what this actually, if you, if you look at that fact, what this actually points to is the strength of the NHS's supporters and defenders in resisting those kinds of policies. So I show in the book how trade unionists organize very, very effectively to stop outsourcing kind of on a, on a local level. Also, somewhat counterintuitively, new cultural traditions that gave the NHS ever more public standing emerged out of this same atmosphere of crisis that was only intensifying from the 1980s. Now, uh, the classic example of this is the celebration of the NHS's birthday. And indeed, even to refer to it as a birthday, right? It's a health system, not a, not a child. But to call it a, a, a birthday in itself is to give the, give the NHS public esteem. Now, in the 19, as I said, in the 1940s and 1950s, there weren't street parties for the NHS. On a popular level, people did not uh, celebrate the National Health Service's anniversary in a way that they do now. So this year in July, we had a, you know, a ceremony in Westminster Abbey. We had buildings lit up in blue. You know, we had, I think, a new 10p piece or something that is minted with the NHS on it. These kinds of things were sort of uh, emerged from the 1980s. And they actually began as a trade union tradition. 
in the early 1980s, it was the trade union pictured, trade unions pictured on the left here. This is an event from, um, I think, Manchester from the early 1980s. They would hold something called NHS Day, where on the 5th of July, the date of the NHS's founding, there would be these kind of family-friendly activities, fates, carnivals, this kind of stuff. And this was a tradition that was picked up by New Labour when they came into power under Tony Blair in 1997. The year after, in 1998, was the NHS's 50th anniversary. It was 50 years old. And this uh, celebration of the NHS on its birthday goes into overdrive at that point. So you see, for example, you see the NHS placed on 50p coins. Many of you will have these rattling around your your purses or your wallets. They were placed on stamps. There was the, the first Westminster Abbey service. There was, a, there was a party at Buckingham Palace. The currency, the stamps, the royal family, the NHS was plugged into the very pillars of what it meant to be British. Surprisingly recently, right? The late, the late 1990s. So what you see then, this is all to say, that out of this atmosphere of crisis, there are these kinds of cultural traditions emerging, which gives the NHS greater standing in public life and therefore more resilience. So what does this all mean, just to finish then, for today and for the future of, of the NHS? Now, I should put my own uh, health warning on this, uh, I'm a historian, not a not a not a doctor or a, a contemporary social policy ex expert. So I don't kind of pretend to have all the the answers that kind of solve the current uh, problems going on with the NHS. I wish I did, but I do think that there are ways that history, thinking about the history of the NHS, can at least help us kind of puncture some of the myths that are with us in debating the NHS and the media, and perhaps offer us a different perspective about its future. So as we all know, the NHS is facing a very, very difficult time right now. Uh, and there's a wide range of, of showing these massive problems. For instance, more than 7.4 million people are waiting for medical treatment in England alone, which is up 3 million from before the pandemic. These are the worst figures on record. Uh, there are big workforce problems in the NHS with unprecedented strike action taking place in response to, uh, for good reasons, low pay and difficult working conditions, including both junior doctors and consultants this week. So with pay levels unfavorable for medical professionals compared in those kinds of roles compared to many other countries, uh, an unknown number of medical practitioners are emigrating. And as a result of these difficulties, there are some familiar claims emerging in the media that the NHS model is unworkable and that it should be abandoned. However, I do think that there are some ways that history um, can help us qualify that and, and reframe those kinds of assertions. And I've organ organized these uh, kind of maybe in a, in a bit of a gimmicky way as kind of lessons from history. Um, but I, I, of course, don't mean to, uh, to lecture you in any way. So the first, I've, I've organised these as, as four. So the first is um, this belief that the NHS is a kind of sacred cow and uh, that cannot be challenged in public life. And if only we could talk about its flaws and its problems openly, so the argument goes, we could fix its problems. This summer, uh, Sajid Javid uh, popped up. Uh, he was former health secretary. Uh, I had to check that he was the health secretary. There's been so many in recent years uh, for reasons you'll all know about. Um, everyone's had about 15 jobs. Uh, he was, he, you know, he, he did a stint, a, 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 a turn being health secretary. He argued that it was time for a, quote, honest assessment about the viability of the NHS and called for a royal commission to explore its viability. Now, Javid ignores 
the 75 years of honest assessments about the NHS that have already occurred, including a royal commission on the NHS, which also included discussion of should it be free, should it be partly financed, all this kind of stuff. In the late 1970s, there was a royal commission on the NHS in the late 1970s, initiated by Harold Wilson. Now, the NHS moreover, has always been contested, as I've shown today. There are always these kind of tension points and grievances and disagreements and so on, even as it grew more popular. Uh, and it acted as this lightning rod for all sorts of controversial issues. As I've shown, people expressed misgivings at its start. People critiqued its paternalism uh, or its treatment of people of colour. And some Conservative par Party politicians have also called for its uh, uh, substantial changes or even for it to be abandoned. So to start then, the first lesson is that history shows that it's a bit of a nonsense that we've never spoken honestly about the NHS and that it, you know, if we started speaking freely about it, we'd solve all its problems. That is simply not true. So the second point is that, um, that history shows us that we need to be somewhat careful when we invoke the term crisis or use that kind of language or exclusively that kind of language, I should say, when discussing the NHS. And that this is, of course, not to deny any of the seriousness, as, uh, as I mentioned, the waiting list figures, the emigration, all of that, the strikes and so on, it's not to deny the seriousness of those problems, but viewing everything through the lens of crisis does frame debate in a certain way. Now, though it might not seem like it today, the atmosphere of crisis around the NHS has amplified, as I've shown, historically at certain points, and particularly after the 1970s. It's not sort of permanent or preordained that there would be this kind of atmosphere around it. Indeed, the nature of what is a crisis also changes. So I mentioned that the crisis in the early 1950s wasn't that there wasn't enough money being spent on the NHS. The crisis is that there was too much money being spent on the NHS. So this, this idea of crisis in itself can change over time. Perhaps some things that are referred to as a crisis now in a newspaper might not seem uh, to be the case in 10, 15 years' time. Um, and it's not... Uh, it's also true, you know, we should point out also that the, this idea of crisis can be used in, for political ends, both by the NHS's supporters, again, to draw attention to the institution, and by its opponents to discredit it and to advance arguments to move to a different model. And it's not the case either, despite this, uh, this rhetoric of crisis, that the, given the current problems that the British public are growing tired of the NHS model, Opinion polls tell us that though the public are frustrated with the waiting lists, they want the existing model to work. There isn't, there isn't really an appetite to uh, engage with a different kind of model. So the question then is, could the NHS model work again? And again, recent history is useful here, and you don't have to go back too far into the deep past to show the NHS on a better footing. On the back of generous funding increases under new Labour governments in the 2000s, where for the first time the UK was brought up to the same level as its international peers, countries like Germany and France, for the first time the UK was spending the same amount of gross domestic product, GDP, on healthcare. And that brought results. Uh, waiting list plummeted when uh, in 2010 it was the highest public satisfaction levels with the NHS on record. Uh, and um, international think tanks, health think tanks, like the Commonwealth Fund, which is based in New York, ranked the NHS first among all healthcare systems, this is the early 2000s, uh, for things like access to care, quality of care, these kinds of things. You don't have to go back to the deep far past to find ways, evidence, if you wanted to make the argument, that the NHS model does work. And that's, of course, withstanding some of the, um, the, uh, the policies that the new Labour introduced that, of course, you know, are now been roundly criticised, such as the private finance initiative, PFI. Uh, Martin kindly uh, took me on a tour earlier to look at the uh, medical school. And, and looking at the medical school is, is it almost in itself looking at the history of the NHS. We have this older kind of building on the left, uh, 
uh, that, that, you know, I, I, I imagine the medical school started with. Then we have a building in the middle and then we have the children's hospital, which is kind of classic PFI architecture, kind of pastel green, cream, dark greys. Actually, this, like this room, like this room. Uh, they, these, that kind of color palette is a, is a, is a PFI uh, hospital. So, and, that, and that policy obviously was very, very expensive. It's been roundly criticized and it was the Conservative Party who abandoned it in 2018. But nonetheless, there were huge funding increases to the NHS um, that happened in that time. Um, just a point on funding, uh, and then I'm going to try and wrap up. Um, it, it seems obvious, but uh, too simple maybe. Um, but the NHS uh, history gives us a, an important vantage point when talking about NHS funding. Uh, as I suggested then, the NHS has largely been underfunded compared to what other countries spend on healthcare. Um, and um, you, this is a chart of, of, of pro proportion of gross domestic products and so how much the British economy is, is, is making each year. And what you see after 2010 is you see a massive drop off, right? So this is the kind of era of austerity under the coalition government where the increases in the NHS budget, the, uh, the depth and length of them, the, 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 the percentage fall is the most stark since the 1950s. That produced very predictable results in terms of workers not having better wages, so going on strike, inability to upgrade facilities, inability to clear waiting list logs, all of this kind of stuff. Now, I'm not claiming for a second that all of the problems with the NHS could be solved by more money, but putting the NHS funding on a kind of sustained level of improvement and not making the kinds of cuts that are going on there in this chart could improve the service, right? That's not, that's not rocket science to make that point. Then the final point um, is that we need to, history shows us that we need to have a bit more of an expansive idea about what health is. So as we know, he your, health, your health is not just shaped by the NHS, it's shaped by what you eat. It's shaped by your access to quality housing, whether you have a secure job, whether you have good pay, all of this kind of stuff, right? And many of the other parts of the welfare state that were, uh, that were aimed at ch challenging those kinds of inequalities, so we think about like council housing, a recent example would be Sure Start centers, which for early years care, uh, a lot of that stuff fell away. And what that meant is, is that the NHS could only do so much, right? It, couldn't, it cannot carry the full burden of uh, sustaining and supporting a healthy population. And we saw this during the pandemic, where there was fairly stark health inequalities on show. To give you a sense of those very depressing figures, the chance of dying from COVID-19 for under 65s in England was 3.7 times higher in the most deprived communities than the richest. Similarly, people from black and ethnic minority communities carried a higher risk of dying than their white counterparts. So these are kind of long-standing health inequalities. And I think the lesson then is that you know, history shows us that the NHS uh, has survived for all sorts of different reasons, but we need a bit of a, we need a broad discussion about what other parts of government policy can uphold the other parts of um, uh, everyone's everyday life that maintains health as well. So I'm going to conclude there. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, here's my email if you have uh, complaints. I also, I also take compliments. Um, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks so much.